Good morning. Um, so if you have been around campus for very long, you know, we've had just a tad bit of construction around here lately. Um, the New Hope Life Center just recently finished, praise Jesus, it's awesome. Um, and then the social hall, which is looking really good, isn't it? And see how they painted the bricks this week? It's really cool. Um, and we're nearing conclusion on that, which is just wonderful. Um, but we us as people, we are also under construction. Our lives, our minds, our character is a work in progress. And so this is week four in our sermon series, Character Under Construction. And over the last few weeks, Pastor Jamie has talked about um, part of growing our character is guarding our hearts, guarding our minds, building spiritual friendships that help uplift us and support us, hold us accountable, help us grow our character. And so today we're going to continue this theme, and we're going to talk about how we can know, how we might be able to assess if our character is growing. Are we becoming the people that God has created us to be, and by what criteria do we measure that? So I'm going to start with a statement that might seem obvious, but it, again, it might not be that obvious. Character matters. Character matters. Can you tap the person next to you and say, your character matters? Good. It does matter. And what do I mean by character? I mean, our character is who you are on the inside, really, right? It's the attitudes that you have swirling around in you. It's your values. It's the behavior that you show to the outside world, but it's also who you are behind closed doors. And our character matters because as Christians, our character should be a reflection of Jesus's character. Our character has a huge impact on the unbelieving world for good or for bad, right? So um, over the years, I've read, I've read many times how wait staff, waiters and waitresses, the hour during the week that they dread the most is the hour after church. And in preparation for this message, I ran across another blog post this week where somebody was talking about how he and his wife had been wait staff in their community for years. And, and he's like, at the time he was a waiter, he was an un unbeliever. And he said they would dread, literally the staff would dread the hour or two after church. Because he said the people would come in from church, sometimes they were even holding their Bibles, or they were wearing t-shirts, you know, that had Christian um, sayings or something on them. And he said they would be rude, and they would be impatient, and they would be unkind, and they were terrible tippers. And, and he said, now looking back on it, now that he does know Jesus, he was saying what a horrible witness that was to everyone in that restaurant. Character matters. Our character really matters. And as Christ followers, our character should be shaped and guided by the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Our goal is to become more like Jesus, right? I'm thinking that most wait staff would love to wait on Jesus. They would love to have Jesus at their table, right? Because Jesus would be kind. Jesus would know their name. Jesus would be really patient with them. Even if the orders got all mixed up, Jesus would be really patient. And I'm guessing Jesus would be a very generous tipper, right? The longer we've known Jesus, the more like Jesus we should become, right? I think everybody probably agrees with that. So I'm 44. I rededicated my life to Christ at age 20. I've had 24 years where my character should have grown. There should have been spiritual growth that made me look more like Jesus today than I did when I was 20. If you accepted Jesus when you were 10 and you're now 70, you've had 60 years theoretically, to grow your character to be more like Jesus. Of course, the real measure of spiritual growth, 
The real measure of transformed character is the evidence of fruit in our life. And of course, that, this is a metaphor that comes from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, starting with verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. Those who belong to Jesus, Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you want to transform our character to be more like you. What a privilege that is, and we're so thankful. God, I just pray that your spirit will be so evident and real in this sanctuary and that you will continue to work within each of us. Guide my words. Guide my words so that each person in here will walk away with what you want them to know. We give you all the glory. Amen. So let me give you some context to Paul's letter to the church of Galatia. So Galatia is somewhere in central Turkey, and this would have been fairly early in Paul's missionary journeys. And what's interesting is he established the church in Galatia, and many, many, many Gentiles heard the gospel and came to know Jesus. And that's a wonderful, beautiful thing, right? So the church became filled with Gentiles. Up to this point, the church had been filled, all the other churches that Paul had been established had been filled with Jewish people. And so with a, with a predominantly Gentile church, this raises all kinds of difficult questions. Do um, the Gentiles who are joining this church, do they have to be circumcised? Um, what parts of the Jewish law do they need to follow? And so over the course of the first four chapters of the book of Galatians, Paul um, talks about their freedom in Christ. And he says, no, you don't have to follow the law in the same way that the Jews follow the law. You don't have to become a Jew before you become a Christian. But he says something really important. He says, our freedom in Christ it doesn't permit you to just act in any old way. They should still behave in a way that reflects God's holy character because character matters, right? They now belong to Christ and they should reflect his character and that's an even more stringent standard. So how is that possible? Aren't we sinful, broken people? I mean, how in the world can we reflect the character of Christ? Well, Paul's saying, not in your own power. In your own power, you cannot reflect Jesus' character. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. Remember, when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and makes a home within us. And I know I say this a lot, but I just still, I still find this absolutely amazing. We say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God comes and makes a home within us. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead comes within us. That's power, friends. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Paul writes in Galatians 5.16, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You see, on our own, you and I, we are a hot mess. We are. We can try and try and try and try to produce the kind of character that reflects Jesus, but on our own, we can't do it. So I want to give you a little demonstration of how this works. It's the Wesleyan view of salvation. So Tina has agreed to be my volunteer. So if you could come up on the deck, Tina. Yeah. I know, she's brave. 
course, I didn't like give her a choice. I said, you will be my volunteer, right? <laughs> okay, so in this illustration, I've done this before, but I think it's a really important one to, to share again. In this illustration, I'm God, which is pretty amusing in and of itself, and Tina, <laughs> Tina is Tina. So Tina, you're a miserable sinner. But here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to send my son to die for you. So that, and he's going to be raised so that you can be forgiven and draw close to me. Because I really, really love you. And I'm going to put my spirit in your heart and I'm going to embrace you in my arms. And forgiveness, salvation, I want you to know it's not about me tolerating you from a distance, but it's about you being loved and delighted in by me. It's about you entering into a relationship that, that is intimate, one in which your life is changed and you are transformed from the inside out. You cannot be embraced by holy God and have his spirit put in your heart and you not be changed. And that's good news, right? Right? So know the joy and the peace and the love that comes with being a follower of Jesus and being made in his likeness. Let the Holy Spirit transform you from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you for being my volunteer. But I, I think that's such an important illustration because we need to know that, that God loves us and delights in us. And, and he's put his spirit in us so that he can transform us from the inside out. You know, often I ask people about their walk with God and they tell me something like this. I'm doing my best to be a good person. Have you heard that before? I'm doing my best to be a good person. I try to be loving. I try to be generous. And I think so often what happens in the church is we try to be good, right? We try to be good. We try to give the appearance of good Christian character. And see, this is heartbreaking for me because I think we're totally missing the point. Walking with God and becoming more like Jesus is not the same as trying to be a good person. Because, friends, we're not good people. We're not. We are broken, flawed people. And we can try really, really, really hard to do the right thing, to make good choices, to be loving, to be peaceful, to be gentle, to be kind, to exhibit self-control. But on our own, if we do this in our own power, if we try to produce fruit in our own power, we're just going to get end up getting burned out. We're going to backslide. We're going to become judgmental. We will, because this is just how human beings work. I know, I'm, I'm a human being. I know, I understand. I've experienced this. You see, if transformation doesn't come from the Holy Spirit, if it's not real heart transformation, then what happens is we give the appearance of looking good. We have the outward appearance of doing the Christian thing, but there's not, not real fruit. There's not real spiritual growth. So I have this picture of a tree. Let's see, it's up there. So this is a mango tree that's been in my backyard for about nine years, okay? And like, it's, it's a nice looking mango tree, right? I mean, it's gotten really big. And every year it produces all this beautiful green foliage. In nine years, I've gotten four mangoes four mangoes. So it looks great, and I've fertilized it, and I've pruned it, and I've done what I can to produce fruit. It is not producing fruit, but it looks awesome on the outside. But four mangoes in nine years does not a mango tree make, right? <laughs> it doesn't even offer much shade. <laughs> but you know, um, the Pharisees were kind of like this, weren't, weren't they? Um, the Pharisees, if you remember, they're a group of religious leaders during Jesus' time, and they were very critical of Jesus. 
they were very much about following a set of rules and looking good on the outside. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus rarely had harsh words for unbelievers. Rarely. To, to unbelievers, he, he was loving, he was patient, he was kind, he was gentle. But with the Pharisees, with the religious people who should have known better, he was quite harsh. And he tells the religious leaders, they appear clean on the outside, but they have neglected the inside. They perform religious acts, but they don't have God-honoring hearts. They don't have God-honoring character. And remember, character, it matters. That's right. He says this in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 26. And these are the words of Jesus. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. So they tried to look good on the outside, but in the inside, they were not loving. They were not caring. They were not gentle. They were not kind. They failed to produce fruit. They failed to have godly character. So where does that leave us? Really, where does that leave us? And I think it's really helpful here to do some self-assessment. I'm all about self-assessment. Those of you who know me, you know my background's clinical social work, so I'm always like, let's talk about how we're doing, how we're feeling. But today we really are. So I want you to think about how are you doing when it comes to your character? Does your character reflect Jesus more today than it did when you said, first said yes to Jesus? Do you exhibit the fruit of the Spirit more today than you did when you first accepted Christ? What about today versus five years ago? What about today versus last year? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's take a moment and we're going to briefly talk about each of these. So I have this um, picture on the screen. You'll see it's fruit. Let's see if we're going to get... There we go. Isn't it cute? So there we have the fruit of the Spirit. And the first one is love. And love is the red apple. That seems appropriate. Love. We are called to love God. We're called to love our neighbor. We are called to love our enemies. So what does that look like in real life? I think Paul gives us a really good illustration of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith, it's always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Wow. So how are you doing when it comes to love? How are you doing with being loving, not just to the people you like, but to all the people in your life? What about joy? Joy. Joy is the, I guess it's an orange. Joy is an orange. And joy is inner contentment regardless of our outer circumstances, right? Joy is not um, dependent on happy things happening. It's an inner contentment that we experience. It's a result of us abiding with Jesus Christ. So how are you doing when it comes to joy? Are you a person of joy? What about peace? Peace. Jesus was the prince of peace, right? Now, peace is, we're supposed to, to have peace with God, peace with others, and peace within ourselves. Do a self-assessment. How are you with peace? What about patience? This is everyone's favorite one. I love the fact that patience is the lemon. So patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Don't you love that? So 
patience illustration. I, um, about two weeks ago, several of us went to a conference in Nashville called um, New Room. It was amazing. It's all about prayer and awakening. I strongly encourage many of you to come with us next year. But I am, I of course got the cheapest plane ticket I could possibly find online, which involved flying through Atlanta. So I know you can see where this is going. So we get to the gate in Atlanta and Delta had overbooked our flight by 10 people. Well, that's a lot of people. And we're all standing there kind of looking at each other. And I mean, you can feel, like I can feel the frustration welling up inside me. Have you been there? Where you can feel it. And I kept saying, Vicki, remember who you are, remember who you are, remember who you are, remember who you are. And the lady next to me was so impatient and angry and tapping her foot. And she kept going up to the lay the poor Delta woman at the counter. What do you mean I'm not going to get on this plane? You better get me on this plane. I mean, she could not have been any more unkind. I get to the conference, and guess who's one of the first people I see? <laughs> yeah. I could not even look her in the eye. Couldn't look her in the eye. Because part of reflecting godly character is patience. And it's hard. It's hard. What about kindness? Kindness is being considerate, putting others before yourselves. Our witness won't have any power. Our witness will not have any power unless we are kind to others. We are called to be light in a dark world. If we are nothing else, friends, let's be kind. Please, let's be kind. What about goodness? How are you doing in goodness? Goodness would be virtue or moral excellence. So is there something in your life that you know is immoral? I don't need to list them. You know what's immoral. How are you doing when it comes to goodness? What about faithfulness? So faithfulness would be doing what you say you're going to do, um, being reliable, being trustworthy. Faithfulness is the banana. I like that. How are you doing on being faithful? Is your yes, yes, and your no, no? Gentleness. Gentleness. Where is it up there? Hmm, it's not there. Okay, well, we'll make it another fruit. A mango. Gentleness. <laughs> yes, exactly. My tree has not produced fruit. Yes. So gentleness is the absence of harshness or severity. Think about your interactions with people. Are you gentle or are you harsh? How are you doing with gentleness? And finally, self-control, everybody's favorite one. Moderation or self-restraint, avoiding extreme behavior, and exercising self-restraint in both our action and our speech. So when we think of self-control, we often think of like self-control in eating or drinking or you name it, the stuff we put into our body, right? But it's also, it's also our speech. So self-control is also this juicy piece of gossip comes across our way. Do we squash it or do we share it? That's self-control. So how are you doing here? You know, I think we all have, we've all been created differently, right? So we all have, have personalities where certain, certain character traits come more easily to us than others. For instance, you know, I tend, I think I'm a pretty patient person. Um, I think my children would probably even agree. They're sitting in the back. I was watching their faces. I think I'm a pretty patient person. I'm a really faithful person. But my self-control can be kind of rough. You know, um, Stacy's pita chips were on sale at Publix last week for buy two, get one free. And once that bag's open, I have no self-control. I eat the whole bag. Please never buy me Stacy's pita chips. Um, but you know, 
This isn't the kind of report card where we can say, well, I'm really good at math, but I'm terrible at English, so I'm just going to focus on math. No, Paul is pretty clear here. He uses the noun fruit, not fruits, plural. We are to develop all of these, whether it's hard or not. The whole of these is how we can tell if the Holy Spirit is transforming our character. Character matters. It matters. And maybe you, like me, as you're going down this list, you realize, oh, I have a long way to go. I have a long way to go. And I don't know about you, but, but you see the desire of my heart, oh, the desire of my heart is that I become the person that God has created me to be. Not just so I'm healed and whole, but so that I can point other people to the one who can make them healed and whole. My character matters. My character really matters. It matters how I treat the woman at the checkout line at Publix. It really matters. It matters how I treat the Delta attendant at the Atlanta airport. It matters. It matters because I am an ambassador for Jesus Christ, because I belong to Jesus and he has placed his spirit within me. So my character matters. So what are we going to do? We know our character matters. We know we want to have produce this fruit of the spirit, but we can't do it in our own power. So what's next? Jesus says something pretty incredible in John 15, 5. Jesus says a lot of incredible things, by the way. But he says this, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then Paul gives us this amazing bit of wisdom in Colossians 2, 7. He says, let your roots grow deep into him. He's talking about Jesus. And let your lives be built on him and your faith will grow strong. So if we remain in Jesus, if we abide in Jesus, if we commune with Jesus, if we dig our roots deep into Jesus Christ, then we're going to grow in love and trust with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will transform us from the inside out. That's how we produce fruit. We get closer to Jesus. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we come to know Jesus Christ and love him and trust him, the more evidence of fruit we're going to have in our life. So how do we do that? Well, who has their spiritual growth card, right? Those spiritual disciplines, they're tools for growing close to Jesus. How in the world are we going to, go to grow close to Jesus if we don't spend time with him? How is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? Are you in God's word? Are you reading scripture? Even if you don't read a whole chapter a day, read a few verses. Let it sink into your soul. Are you coming to worship regularly? Are you making that a priority? Are you, are you meeting with others in small community? Do you have a connect group where people can hold you accountable? I know I need people to hold me accountable for them to say, Vicki, I'm not so sure about that. And I have close um, girlfriends who will say that to me. What about serving others? Serving others, getting outside ourselves. And finally, giving. You know, giving is a spiritual discipline. Because when we tithe our money and our time, it changes our heart. I promise you that. You know, these, these are the things that are the fertilizer. They're the rain. They're the sunshine that allow fruit to be produced in our lives. Character matters. Character matters. It matters to the unbelieving world. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that, that you want to produce fruit within us. We're so grateful for that. And I just pray for each and every person here. God, I pray that you just give us the self-awareness that we need to know where we need to grow. 
and give us the courage and the motivation to say, yes, Jesus, I, I want to spend more time with you. Help me find a way to spend more time with you because I want to be the person that you've called me to be. I'm tired of being average or being okay. I want to be the person that, that you've in, you created me to be. We love you, God. Amen.